we've had a lot of wiggle room regarding legacy sets. How can we make those legacy sets feel the same? But we had that chance to just go on and push really hard and we need to be able to feel that we can watch Rogue One and Episode Four back to back and feel like they're from the same period. Rogue One was the first anthology film to enter into the Star Wars canon and was written to tie directly into the events of A New Hope. So it's not surprising that there are several references and details that you will only notice if you watch these two films back to back. And I'm here today to talk about the most interesting ones with seven tiny details you only notice if you watch Rogue One and A New Hope back to back. Prepare a boarding party. Suddenly your brain is exploding with not only our film, but the other film, which is about to come to life. Rebels on Scarif. I need to speak with Admiral Radis. He's returned to his ship. He's going to fight. In Rogue One, we get to see the Death Star plans transmitted to Admiral Radis' flagship, where the Tantiv IV is waiting in dry dock aboard the flagship due to an impaired hyperdrive. When the flagship is disabled and Vader boards the ship, the Rebels are forced to retreat to the Tantive and bring the Death Star plans with them, beautifully setting up the stage for the opening of A New Hope. However, this is accompanied by a slight detail that could have actually changed the course of galactic history if we were meant to take it as true. Back on Yavin 4, before the battle, when Mon Mothma says that she needs to speak to Admiral Raddus, she is informed that he has already returned to his ship and is going to Scarif to fight. Following this, the Rebels man their X-Wings and take off to join Admiral Raddus. However, it is after this, after the X-Wings take off, which is already after Raddus left, which Raddus left in his flagship that had the Tantive IV in it, that we see R2-D2 and C-3PO, with C-3PO commenting on his befuddlement at the fact that he has once again been left in the dark. Scarif? They're going to Scarif? Why does nobody ever tell me anything, R2? Of course, he's not the only one who's left in the dark, since this means that we are meant to assume that C-3PO and R2-D2 actually weren't on board the Tantive IV. In the grand scheme of things, this plot hole is barely a problem and is really only noticeable if you watch the films back to back. Still, I can't help but think that if this scene were canon, or rather if we were meant to take it seriously and 3PO and R2-D2 truly were left behind, then Leia would not have been able to send the message to Tatooine, Luke wouldn't have found R2 and gone with Obi-Wan to Alderaan, and the original trilogy just wouldn't have happened at all. Ultimately, this doesn't break continuity because this little appearance is little more than an Easter egg, it's just a cute little joke, but it does go out to show that if you change even the smallest detail, the entire series falls apart. Oh, I'm so confused. When Michael Giacchino was brought on to score Rogue One, he was faced with a monumental task. To be the first composer other than John Williams to score a feature-length live-action Star Wars cinematic release. Giacchino did a brilliant job setting up the musical tone for Rogue One, with music that totally fit within the Star Wars world without just reusing all of Williams' old work. However, there is one musical leitmotif that really stands out if you watch Rogue One and A New Hope back to back. I want to give a shout out to Sideways for actually pointing this out in his video where he breaks down the music of Rogue One. But basically, one of the themes that plays throughout Rogue One is titled Jin Erso's Theme and Hope Sweet. very high. I always thought this was a new piece of music, but going back to watch A New Hope directly after watching Rogue One, if you're paying attention to the music, then you'll hear this. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. I can't get involved. While I'm not sure whether or not I would have noticed this on my own, I can say with certainty that watching Rogue One and A New Hope back-to-back -back after watching Sideways video, it is definitely there. 
Michael Giacchino basically took this tiny musical movement that accompanies Leia's message and turned it into the theme for the person who made that message possible. It's such an insignificant piece of music in the OT only showing up in this one scene, but that is kind of emblematic of Rogue One as a story. The entire movie is the story of a footnote, a story that was little more than a sentence in the opening crawl. In the same way that sentence was expanded into entire film, here is the musical equivalent of a sentence that was turned into the main theme for that same film, which I think is pretty cool. Sorry for the bad audio quality here, but I really wasn't content to just put something on the screen. I gave credit to Sideways for discovering the connection between Rogue One and A New Hope, and I found out while editing that he actually didn't give credit to Rebel Force Radio for making that discovery, and I kind of felt duped. He did go in and add it in the description, but I wanted to make sure that I said it clearly here so the proper people got credit, and I wanted to make sure I didn't just put it on the screen just in case there's anyone out here who's just listening to me and isn't actually watching the video. So uh, here's a little clip from Rebel Force Radio. This is where they talk about their discovery of this musical connection. Giacchino did it, right? Uh, he he did that, and, and I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a couple more things here. I want to play a clip for you. I can't get involved. Mind blown. I've got work to do. It's not that I. Okay. Mind blown. We've had the soundtrack to Rogue One for 40 years. <laughs> Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? We intercepted those transmissions. With the exception of that small ordeal with 3PO and R2 being left behind and almost making it so the OT didn't happen, Rogue One took great care to preserve continuity between itself and A New Hope. I said earlier that Rogue One is essentially a full movie based on a single line from the opening crawl, but that's not totally accurate since there are a handful of throwaway lines that also informed the writing of this story. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by rebel spies. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. Vader refers to the plans being beamed to the Tantive via transmission, which was preserved in Rogue One. If the ground team had been able to leave Scarif with the physical plans, that line would have been a continuity error, but their escape was blocked, so they had to use the satellite to beam the transmissions to the ship. Also, a little fun easter egg, but in Rogue One there are two stormtroopers talking about how the BT-15 was marked obsolete. Hey, did you hear the rumors? Yeah, the T-15s have been marked obsolete. And in A New Hope, we can see two stormtroopers saying, You seen that new BT-16? Yeah, some of the other guys telling me about it. Both of these scenes feature two stormtroopers talking while our heroes sneak around them, making us almost wonder if this is all stormtroopers talk about when they think that no one is around. What have you done with those plans? We intercepted no transmissions! <laughs> also, Leia is a bold-faced liar. This point doesn't really require you to watch films back-to-back, -back, but if you've simply watched A New Hope and Rogue One at any point, you'll likely notice how silly it is for Leia to be trying to talk her way out of this. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't act so surprised, Your Highness. You weren't on any mercy mission this time. Years ago, you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. In the opening crawl for A New Hope, we are told that Leia is on her way to Alderaan when she was intercepted by Darth Vader to bring the Death Star plans to her father but her capture forces her to send the plans to the surface in the care of R2-D2. This was never a plot hole, but to me it always seemed awfully convenient that she just happened to be captured over a planet where she happened to know a former Jedi was on the surface and would be willing to help. In A New Hope, Leia's only goal seems to be getting the plans to Alderaan, and Obi-Wan felt like an afterthought, like a backup plan of sorts. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. However, this still was hinted at in A New Hope since Leia says in her message, Now my father begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack and I'm afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. Implying that Tatooine was still a part of the plan. However, we get more context in Rogue One when Bail Organa and Mon Mothma discuss the inevitability of war. First, Bale says that he is returning to Alderaan, confirming that he would have just arrived by the time the Death Star did. Second, he tells Mon Mothma that he is sending his daughter, someone he trusts, 
to Tatooine on a mission to retrieve the Jedi who served him in the war, which is Obi-Wan. This tells us that Tatooine was always the plan, confirming that Leia was purposefully there to retrieve Obi-Wan. Friend. The Jedi. Yes, I will send for him. You will need someone you can trust. I would trust her with my life. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. What? When Luke is training against the remote on the Millennium Falcon, Han Solo says, Hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side. I love this line. If you watch the films in the order of release, this line serves to show us the state of the galaxy during the reign of the Empire, and plays as a mirror to what Tarkin says to Vader a few moments later. The Jedi are extinct. Their fire has gone out of the universe. You, my friend, are all that's left of their religion. This line frames the Jedi as anachronistic myth, making them underdogs rather than heroes. However, if you watch the films in chronological order, this line occurs exactly one hour and one minute after this. This adds a level of irony Ironic. to the line since we, the audience, know the truth, but the characters within the story are kept in the dark. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side. They let us go. It's the only explanation for the ease of our escape. Easy, you call that easy. After the Millennium Falcon escapes the Death Star, Leia instantly knows that they are being tracked due to the incredibly minimal presence of stormtroopers and TIE fighters. This line shows an incredible amount of competence on Leia's part, being the only one on board who understands the importance of the message that she's carrying and the amount of resources the Empire would be ready and willing to throw at them to stop them from getting those plans. Now, Han interprets this as an insult against him, interpreting what she's saying as, well, if you could get away from them, then they must have not been trying hard enough. As if saying that Han is so incompetent that the only way he could escape is if they let him go. No reward is worth this. However, the mentalities of these characters also make sense. Han is a smuggler, and as good as he is, there is no smuggler worth all the trouble of sending this. Leia, on the other hand, was captured directly after a battle wherein she witnessed the Empire sending out way more troops and fighters than we see them doing in A New Hope. See, to a smuggler, this seems like a lot, but to the Rebellion, this is minimal. This line is contextualized by watching Rogue One since we literally just saw how many TIE fighters and soldiers the Empire has and is willing to throw at the Rebels to stop them from getting the plans that they are getting away with now. Leia concludes logically that if they were willing to do that just days ago, and yet here they only encounter a battalion of stormtroopers and four TIE fighters, then it's clear that they are letting them go on purpose. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? As an honorable mention, I wanted to jump back to a smaller detail. One thing you may notice watching the films back to back is that Tarkin never left the Death Star. We see him arrive in the midpoint of Rogue One, and he is still on it when A New Hope starts, telling us that he likely never left the Death Star since almost no time passes between the two films. While this doesn't really change anything, it just kind of stuck out to me personally. We must scatter the fleet. We have no recourse but to surrender. So, the Rebel Alliance we see in Rogue One is significantly larger than that which is present in A New Hope. While we know that a large portion of their fleet and ground forces were destroyed at Scarif, it's these guys I want to talk about. These guys, right here. In Rogue One, these naysayers were already talking about disbanding the Rebel Alliance. While several of the characters in Rogue One were obviously cast due to their resemblance of characters from the original trilogy, such as General Dodonna and, of course, Mon Mothma, there are several characters in Rogue One who are totally new and unrecognized. The fact that these new faces are the same individuals who believe that open war with the Empire is foolish, it's likely that these characters abandoned the rebel cause around the Battle of Scarif. However, I think it's likely that the entire Alliance may have almost disbanded entirely. After Vader captures Leia, he instructs the officer, 
send a distress signal, and then inform the Senate that all aboard were killed. In short, the rebels were still licking their wounds after the Battle of Scarif, only to receive word that Senator Organa's ship suffered a catastrophic accident wherein everyone on board was killed. If they didn't question the truth of the message, the entire Battle of Scarif would now be considered a failure since the message that so many died for was lost with Leia. In the course of a week, they would have lost a major part of their fleet, Admiral Raddus, their beloved Princess Leia, and the Death Star plans, and soon Alderaan and Bail Organa would fall as well. Honestly, that should have worked, and I'm kind of surprised that there were any rebels waiting for Leia when she got to Yavin. I don't know, maybe they were packing up and getting ready to leave when she arrived. Maybe finding out that Leia survived and Vader's message was a lie brought many rebels back into the fight. That would certainly explain why the rebels have more resources and men in Rogue One and Empire Strikes Back, and it would also explain why characters like Mon Mothma are nowhere to be found in A New Hope. Ultimately, that's just speculation, but... But anyway, those were seven tiny details that I noticed while watching Rogue One and A New Hope back to back. Tell me in the comments if there were any you noticed that I missed, because as always, I want to know what you, my friends, have to say about our favorite galaxy far, far away. If you liked the video, be sure to use those force powers of yours to hit subscribe. Or if you learned absolutely nothing new, feel free to leave a thumbs down absolutely guilt free because that tells me I'm not doing my job. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, may the lore be with you now and forever.